This hour I need to talk about uh, why think, the question why think. Um, there's you know, a tremendous amount of material we could have covered in the last hour. <coughs> uh, I'd like to, uh, I didn't read one of these quotes that I have here, and I'd like to read it to you before we uh, get into the question of um, why think. It's from a 20th century pornographer, uh, but highly regarded as a, um, a writer, D.H. Lawrence. And um, this is what he wrote. Uh, this is what D.H. Lawrence once said. Uh, My great religion is a belief in the blood, the flesh, as being wiser than the intellect. We can go wrong with our minds, but what our blood feels and believes and says is always right. We can go wrong with our minds, but what our blood feels and believes and says is always right. See, he had a he had a philosophy behind the phrase gut instinct. <laughs> Trust your gut instinct. It's always right. Um, well, it's uh, just the philosophical foundation of pornography here. Why think? Well, as I mentioned offhand last hour, the first commandment. Why think? The first commandment. I'll give you some, um, before I actually read the first commandment, let me uh, give you some uh, numbers of occurrences again of in the King James Version anyway. The word think, I told you, occurs uh, 82 times. The word know, 1,400. Uh, The word consider, 98. The word meditate, 14. The word understand, 266. The word wisdom, 234. The word knowledge, 172. The word thought, 139. The word teach, 178. Instruct, 65. Reason, 91. Uh, by contrast, uh, the word feel occurs seven times. The word experience occurs four times. And the word sense appears zero. Um, a religion, someone once says, in order to be accepted has to be satisfactory to whoever the believer is. and has to be satisfactory. And those who accepted pagan religions before Christ accepted them because they were satisfactory. Uh, Pagan religions satisfy uh, the desires of the flesh. They satisfy uh, the desires of emotions. They satisfy uh, the desires of action. They satisfy the desires of a feeling of reverence or awe, but Christianity alone satisfies the mind. Christianity alone has the answers, and the answers are intellectual. So if you want a, a, a religion of excitement, if you want a religion of emotion, if you want a religion of appealing to the flesh, Christianity isn't for you. Let's look at uh, some of these commandments in Scripture, beginning with the first commandment. <clears throat> Turn, I guess, to Exodus 20. And this is the way uh, God reveals the Ten Commandments uh, to Israel. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He gives them information. This is who I am. He begins with information. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. If you thought you got out on your own, you're wrong. I did it. You shall have no other gods before me. But in that first sentence, we have the basis for all the following commands. The commandment by itself, you shall not murder, means nothing. Without that preamble, I am the Lord your God, and it is I who am writing these. The commandments mean nothing. Why should anyone obey them? Somebody walks up to you and says, you shall not murder. Why? Who are you? Says who? God answers that question before it comes up. 
and he gives the basis, and the basis is a very mundane, literal statement. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I have liberated you. I am your God. I've given you freedom. This is who I am. And that is why I have the authority to impose these commands on you. And without that basis, without that information, the commands would be meaningless. We have no reason to know who's, who's speaking unless the speaker identifies himself. In the New Testament, uh, Christ refers, the, the question comes up, uh, what is the greatest commandment? And he gives the greatest commandment. Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how do we love God? How do we love God? The first commandment is to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's not referring to four different parts of man. When we get to the doctrine of man, we'll talk about that. It's piled up for evidence. I mean, for emphasis, not for evidence, but for emphasis. Love God totally. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, it's amazing what some theologians have done. They've developed theories of a man having three, four, five, six parts. You know, one part is his heart, and one part is his soul, and one part is his spirit. And uh, one part of his is his body, and, and so on and so on. Um, the Bible knows nothing of such doctrines of man. Uh, in this particular case, it's simply done for emphasis. Love God totally. And how do you do that? Is is the commandment to have an emotion? Is it a commandment to have a feeling? What is it? Now, if we believe that God has given us a book of a thousand pages, and we do, how do you show your love for the author? How do you show your love for an author who has given you a book of a thousand pages containing 10,000 propositions? I heard somebody say it. Read it. Read it. Do we really believe this is the word of God? Do we really believe that? Or is that something we've just grown accustomed to hearing? If we really believe that this is the word of God, we ought to read it. And I don't mean just what goes by the name of devotional reading. That is, you sit down for ten minutes before you fall asleep and read a chapter or a few verses. I mean getting out your paper and your pen and going through the scripture slowly and reading it as if you loved God. As if you had a book here written by the author of the universe. As if you had a letter here from the creator who made you. And sometimes I think we don't read the scripture because we really don't believe it's God's word. But the way, the first, without which nothing, the first way we love God is by reading his word. We read Psalm 1 in the first hour about the godly man who meditates in the law day and night. Now obviously we don't have time to sit down with our pen and our paper and our Bible in front of us uh, 24 hours a day. But we can commit the word to memory. And we can recall it. And we can think about it. We can think, now how does the doctrine of creation affect the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture? How are those two connected? And we can ponder these questions. If God did not create uh, the universe, can we have any confidence in the inspiration of Scripture? And I don't simply mean that, uh, well, then we can't believe Genesis 1. But if he's not the creator, he doesn't have the power to control the minds of men so that they write the truth. The doctrine of inspiration necessarily depends on the doctrine of creation. The one explains the other. And it fits together. And what we should do is read the scripture, 
with the idea of figuring out how the various doctrines of Scripture fit together. 